In this beginner's guide to animation series, we're helping you to bring your creations to life. In the first episode, we looked at keyframes, so do make sure you check that out first. In this episode, we're looking at the graph editor, and we'll be using that to make a bouncing ball. This video is aimed at beginners that are relatively happy with the Blender interface. If you need a complete starting from scratch guide to Blender, then check out my complete beginner's guide, link in the description. Okay, so I'm in the basic startup file. I've got my screencast keys down the bottom corner here. And I'm in Blender 4.1, but this video should be relatable from Blender 4 onwards. Okay, so instead of a cube, we're going to have a sphere. So I'll delete the default cube, Shift A to add, or you can go to the add menu up here, mesh, and then UV sphere. I right click on the sphere and shade smooth. So we've got a nice ball and I want a floor for it to bounce on. So Shift A to add, mesh, and then plane. And let's scale that up a bit. So we've got our floor already. So with the sphere selected, I want it to bounce up and down. So let's bring up the timeline to start with. And let's go to front view with one on my numpad. So my plane is currently right on the grid floor. So I can use the X axis along here as that point. So I can, with my sphere selected, press G, Z, one, and press enter to bring that above the floor. So it's sitting right on the floor. I'll zoom out a bit and I want it to move up, let's say three blender units. And what we'll start off doing is just setting a keyframe here, one at the top of the bounce, and another one down here. And that would be a good challenge for you to try and do that yourself. So set up those three keyframes, one at the bottom, one at the top, and one at the bottom to create a simple animation of the ball going up and down. And to start off with, we'll make that whole movement happen over 30 frames. Pause the video and have a go at that. Okay, so hopefully you've gotten okay with that. So of course I need to set a keyframe here. I can press I to insert keyframe. And remember that sets it on all the channels. And you can see the channels here if I open up my side dialog box, the tools on the side, and then the summary, you can see the object transforms there, and it's set it for all the transform points, if I press I, that is. I'll just zoom in a little bit with the wheel of my mouse, and hold down the wheel to move across, in the same way as the viewport. I'll go to frame 15, I can press G, Z, three, for three blender units, and press enter, and this time I'll press K, and I'll keyframe the location. So you can see there, it's only added the keyframe on the location and it's not changed the scale or the rotation just here. I'll move that up so you can see them all there. And for the last keyframe at frame 30, we can actually just copy this one. So I could select the summary keyframe at the top or I could just select these location keyframes here by holding down shift and shift D to duplicate and move that across to frame 30. Now what we should see when we go across the timeline is going up and down like so. So hopefully you've gotten okay with that. What I'll do now is I'll bring this up slightly further and I'll talk you through the other animation windows. Now we've got the dope sheet that's extremely similar to the timeline. It's got a few differences, but we don't have to worry about those at the moment. We've got the graph editor, which I'll talk about at the moment. We've also got drivers in there so you can control different objects with other objects or drivers. And we've got the non-linear animation. I'll just click on that and show you that this sphere has an action here, which is the sphere going up and down. And you can have several actions on an object, let's say a walk cycle for a character, a run cycle and so on. And you can kind of paste these together a bit like you would in a video editing program. But that's for another day. Let's go back now to the graph editor and take a look at that. So clicking on the graph editor, I'll press N to get rid of the toolbar here. But just be aware there are lots of useful things in the toolbar like modifiers that you can add, such as cycling your animations and so forth, which are really useful. But for now, I'll press N to get rid of that panel. And let's zoom in on this area. I'll open up the object transform so we can see our different channels. And the only actual channel we need to worry about is the Z location here. If I select that, you can see it highlights this curve here. And that is the only one that's actually showing any difference. All the others are straight lines. So if I choose the X axis here, you can see it's at zero and it's completely flat. And like I say, a completely flat line shows that no animation is happening on that channel. Now you might be thinking, what's this line up here? Well, that's the scale of the X, Y, and Z, which are all set to one. And again, they're all flat, so nothing's happening. So the only channel I'm actually worried about is the Z location. And I can press Shift H to highlight only that channel. You can see the other ones have had their eyes turned off. So we're focused in on this channel. Let's zoom into this a little bit closer. Incidentally, if I hold down Control and middle mouse button, I can zoom out width ways by moving side to side. Okay, so this curve indicates the speed at which the changes happen. I'll just quickly go to the output settings and change the end frame to 30 and then play through the animation. 
and you can see this looping. And you'll notice that it slows down as it gets to the bottom and the top. So I'll pause that for a moment. That's because the steeper the curve, the faster the movement, and the shallower the curve, the slower the movement. So here, if I exaggerate this, we're very slow to start off through the first few frames. We speed up because the curve is much steeper, and then it starts to slow down at the top as it becomes more shallow, and then speeds up as it gets steeper, and slows down again as it becomes shallow. Now this is very useful because a ball, when it bounces, it hits the floor and it bounces up quite fast. The impact sends it back upwards quickly. Now that does change a little bit if this is really a squashy ball and it squashes right down, that will take some of the impact. But if you imagine something hard like a golf ball, when you drop a golf ball, it pings off the ground really firmly. And we can simulate that with these curves. If I select this point here and scale it right down, can you see how it changes the curve? So it becomes like a point. And I'll do the same for this one over here because that's the end point and it restarts there. So we want this to be sharp as well. So I'll scale this down really small like this. And now what happens when it kind of hits the floor? I'll press play, it pings up again. But what you'll notice is that it doesn't slow down enough at the top. Let's see it again. It sort of moves up and then quickly moves down. We need it to kind of float at the top. So we can select this one here and scale it up like this. And now if I press play, it bounces up and pauses at the top. It really slows down and almost floats at the top and then pings off the floor again. Incidentally, if you do want a really comprehensive guide to animation, then do check out my full animation course that goes right from the basics through to animating characters and putting them in game engines. Only $15, link in the description. So these curves can make a really big difference to the way your animation looks and you can have a huge amount of control in the graph editor. Now it's worth pointing out, if I select one of these points and press V, you have different handle types. So at the moment we're on aligned. That means if I select one of the ends here, I could do something strange like this. Let's see what that looks like. So you can see this sort of steep curve here, it's going up a bit higher and then taking an age to come down to here. I'll undo that though. So you can grab an end and move the curve around like this. I could even G to grab and move this one in like so but it still influences the other side. I'll undo that again. And with the middle selected, I'll press V again. Incidentally, you can go to the key menu and this is under handle type here. And you can change this to something like free and then you can move each side around independently. There's also vector, which will give a sharp point like this, but I would suggest for now, free and aligned are the ones you probably want to use as a beginner. So I'll undo those changes so it's back to aligned so that changing one side will affect the other. Okay, so I'll deselect all my points. Notice that under the keying menu, there's another option under handle type, there's interpolation mode. And the three I want to talk about here are constant, linear, and bezier. We're currently on bezier, so that's the curves. If I change this to linear, oh, I've got to select my points, and press T is the shortcut to get to interpolation types. If I change this to linear, you can see each point is just a sharp transition. And if I play this, you can see the effect that that has. And again, with all of them selected, if I press T and go back to Bezier, you can see it goes back to what I had before with my handles. And lastly, if I press T and change it to constant, you can see what that does. It's basically an on and off. So a challenge to you is to look at this graph and imagine what's going to happen. Just have a quick think about that. Okay, so like I said, it's on and off. And if I play the animation, it's either up or down. That can be really useful for something like eyes blinking, or things that just have to turn on and off, like lights and so forth, and sometimes for blocking out an animation. But again, I'll press T and go back to the Bezier. And we've got a nice bouncing ball kind of floating in the air and hitting the ground hard. Okay, so what I want to do, if I zoom out just a touch, I'll extend my animation out to something like 90 frames. And I want my ball to bounce up, down and up slightly less and down and up slightly less and down as if it's losing momentum. Now in the same way as the timeline and the dope sheet, I can copy these keyframes. So I can select this one, shift D to duplicate, and I can press the X axis. Remember the X axis is slightly different on the graph editor because it's a 2D representation. So the X axis in the graph editor is going across this way. The Y axis is this way. So the X axis in the graph editor is time and the Y axis is the change. So don't get confused with the viewport's Cartesian coordinates there. So I've copied this frame across. So we've got it bouncing back up in the air, but we need to bring this down a bit. So I'll press G to grab in the Y axis. 
because it's 2D, remember, and bring it to about halfway, which is around about there. So it will lose half its inertia. I can then copy this one here. So Shift D to duplicate in the X axis, bring that across to frame 60 and just quickly play that. So it bounces, bounces less, and now we want to bounce even less over here. So quick challenge to you is to duplicate the frames and make it bounce half the amount again and end at frame 90. Pause the video and have a go at that. Okay, so I'll copy this frame, Shift D to duplicate in the X axis up to what I was 75. G to grab in the Z axis, so it's coming down to about 0.75. Select this keyframe here, Shift D to duplicate in the X axis and go across to frame 90. And then let's play through our animation. So that's good in terms of how much it's bouncing, but in terms of timing, it's dreadful. This one here needs to take the most time, so the biggest width. Then this one needs to be shorter, and this one needs to be shorter again. So what we can do, like we're able to in the timeline, we can select these keyframes here and scale them down. Now, if I press S to scale, it scales on the medium point or the middle point of these keyframes. So I'll undo that. I can change that up here to be the 2D cursor it's called, and I can shift right click to move that 2D cursor around my graph editor. Oh, somehow I managed to deselect my points, so I'll reselect those again. And I can then scale them in the X axis, so they come across probably somewhere around here. It can be fairly rough. So this one takes 20 frames and we'll have this last one here take less. So I'll press shift right click, move my 3D cursor to this point, scale in the X, and let's make that take 10 frames and just see how that looks. So press play. And that looks quite good, but we probably want a few more down here where it diminishes slowly. And the whole thing could probably do with being a little bit quicker. So that's a good challenge to you. Create two more bounces where they gradually get smaller and smaller, and then reduce the whole animation to something that you think feels a bit more comfortable. Pause the video and have a go at that. Okay, so I'll zoom in just a little bit here. I'll select these two at the end here, shift each duplicate in the x-axis and bring those across. So I'll start off at the same size, bring it down, G then Z, so it's about halfway again, and then reduce those two. So scale in the x-axis to somewhere around here. And with both those selected, I can shift D in the x again, bring those across, bring this down, G then Z to somewhere around there. You might want to zoom in a bit and just reduce this one. We could even with that selected, if I press V, change it to free, and I could make these really sharp by bringing them in like this but it won't make too much difference with only a tiny movement like this. Okay, I'll zoom out just a touch, and I want to bring the whole animation in, so select all, move the 3D cursor to the beginning. It doesn't matter what height I put it at because I'm always scaling in the x-axis, so scale x, bring that in to somewhere around here, and let's play the animation. And that looks about right. I think I'll cut the last bit of the animation off, so we'll end about 55. So again, under my output properties, I'll change this to 55, and we should have a reasonable looping animation now. And that looks great. So hopefully you got an okay with that and you enjoyed the process and you've learned a bit now about the graph editor. If you've got any questions, then do comment below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.